Um, thanks for coming in. Um, hopefully, uh, not too tired here on Friday. Um, so this is the Android upstreaming uh, net filter and then general status and discussion. Just, um, I'm John Stoltz, and Matthew Poye is over here. Um, just quick overview of what we're going to cover. Um, Matthew's going to talk about his recent net filter work, um, and then I'm going to trade out and uh, talk some just general status on Android upstreaming and then have some space for open discussion. So uh, move on up if uh, you want to participate in talks. So, uh, and with that, I'll trade off with Matthew. All right, so um, uh, good day. So um, I'll be talking about some of the work I've been doing uh, in the area of, of streaming uh, Android components that were related to a net filter. At first, we didn't think it would be a, a huge endeavor, but it ended up being a bit more tricky than, than we thought. Um, so Android had the requirements on the NetFilter framework. Um, two, mo two main requirements. The first one was to be able to track traffic based on uh, different applications uh, handling a socket through different processes. So if you have an application that starts, that requests uh, the download of a certain media off the internet, uh, it's not that application that is necessarily responsible to see that process uh, downloading, the, downloading the file in its entirety. So the socket, as it is being used, uh, might actually migrate uh, between different or applications in order to um, have that process happening. So one of the main requirements was to be able to track sockets and, and statistics on sockets as they are moved between or throughout applications. Um, another of the requirements that they had is to block uh, sending or receiving traffic once a coda has been specified uh, from the user interface. So these are the, uh, the main thing they wanted to see happening. And last but not least, uh, they needed a way for third-party applications to be able to um, get their own network statistics um, in whichever way they wanted. So NetFilter was definitely the best option that was available to them. So they implemented that functionality using three NetFilter uh, modules, QTAG ID, um, uh, yeah, Quota 2, and the idle timer. So we'll, we'll go through each of them, see what they do, and, and from there we'll uh, present the solution that Lonero and the various upstream maintainers have uh, come up with in order to uh, make everything uh, upstreamable. But first, okay, so um, QTAC ID, as I mentioned, that's the main entity that will see that, or that will keep the statistics on sockets as they go through application. So it's a bit bloated, it's a bit uh, of a jack of all trade, but at the time that they did that, they did not really had any other solutions. So they decided to uh, packet it all in one app, um, all in, in one filter, and so that the pollution on the rest of the system would be minimal. So, um, yeah, as I mentioned, it, trawl, it tracks uh, interface statistic as it moves or it's being handled by various components of the architecture. Um, quarter two and idle timer. So quarter two was responsible for enforcing traffic shaping. It is directly taking for, from the, uh, the net filter or the Xtable add-on project and um, on top of uh, tracking statistics for an interface, it will send a U event to user space uh, whenever that coda has been reached. The idle timer, that's a um, very, very small modification there. It simply allows the connectivity service um, to deal with interfaces that are going up and down and that would not necessarily inform the rest of the system. So all this thing is, is all great, it's work well, it's working well, but it can't go upstream simply because it is duplicating a lot of functionality that is currently available. So maintainers looked at it, uh, thought it was all great, but um, there's a way to do better. So we can take that functionality, tweak some of the existing um, net filter entities that we currently have upstream, and that would achieve the same results. 
So the idea was to replace everything that it's in QTAG uh, UID with uh, functionality provided by the NFQ uh, NetFilter entity. At first, we were not sure, but uh, the maintainer uh, last year at, uh, in New Orleans assured us that sending this much information to user space for processing would not impact the system, since that's exactly what, um, that's exactly the reason why NFQ was, uh, was invented. Um, so the functionality provided by CODA2, which is to restrict uh, data flow when CODAs have been reached. Um, NF accounting, uh, part of NFAC, which is part of the NF, account, NF accounting framework, already accounts for uh, uh, statistics at the byte and packet level. So it was a natural extension to simply introduce a coda in there. The work that is being done in the kernel is, is fairly small. Uh, the amount of code to add a coda to an existing or the existing XTNF Act is, is actually quite, quite small, and the modifications are simple. The bulk of the work happens in user space. Uh, the maintainer wanted us to uh, reuse the current entities in user space that are uh, managing the NF accounting framework in the kernel. And that entity is a binary called NFAC, or NF Accounting. NF Accounting is, re is responsible for creating um, named entity, and those entities are then passed on to the IP table framework in order to track statistics in various queues. In order to communicate between NFAC and uh, the kernel, the author has decided to use libnfnl, which is a netlink library. So NFAC uses that library in order to send netlink information to the kernel and receive um, acknowledgements, acknowledgements back. The problem is that that library has not been ported to Android. Instead, Android used libnl. And it's not the entire libnl library that they used they decided to take whatever they needed in there, implement a few hack in Android, just enough to get the, the WPA supplicant uh, to get to, to work properly. So the main, the main work that we had to do was to port or provide uh, an NF act that would work with libnl. And we also needed to introduce libnl to Android. After those two things, we had to introduce as well um, the mechanism in the IP table to deal with these new codas. So that code, that code has been pushed. Uh, it's also public. Um, it's been pushed to both our Git, uh, our Android Git repo here at Venero and also push to AOSP. So in that area, things are working well. So on the user space, uh, everything has been assimilated in AOSP and in our Android distro um, at Monero. The only thing that is still out of three are the enhancement that we've did, that we've done to the kernel module that, in, um, that controls the coda. Um, so as I mentioned, most of the bulk of the work has been pushed and published, so we're very happy about that. Um, what we are struggling with a little bit are uh, the modifications and how we're going to uh, enhance NF Act with CODA capability. Uh, so there's a bit of back and forth we have with the maintainers. Um, we, had a, we had a plan. That plan seems to have changed recently. Um, so I'm, I'm working on that. Uh, hopefully, we don't have to start from the, uh, the beginning, but that might be the case. We were targeting 315, then it became 316. And with, uh, with these new uh, requests that came in, I'm not sure that we'll be in 317, so we'll have to see. Uh, at Google, uh, JP uh, was supposed to uh, investigate how easy and feasible it would be for him to move everything that's in QTAG XUID um, to NFQ. So that has been stalled by other uh, high priority tasks that he has, um, mainly for Android 64. So they did a lot of work in that area. 
Um, as I mentioned, Libanon has been completely pushed to AOSP. Uh, that broke the WPA supplicant um, and other applications, so I understand that um, work is well on the way in that area to, uh, to make things um, working again. Uh, at, the Android team wants to move to LibNL 2.0, so there's a lot of, of, of motivation uh, to see that working. Okay. So um, that's basically the status of, of what I have. Uh, things are, are, are going well, but we've hit a few bumps. Uh, we're happy that, that people at Google are actually working with us on this. They're, they've been very proactive. It's been actually fun to work with them. They're receptive. Uh, so it's very motivating. All we need to do now is to find a solution for the very small amount of code that we have in the kernel. And uh, that seems to be uh, a bit more difficult than we wanted. So there's, that's definitely a surprise. So stay tuned. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, my email is on there. I'll be happy to, uh, to help you. Now John. Well, thanks, Matt. Uh, just wanted to cover some recent accomplishments uh, from the team here. Um, basically, uh, since 3.12, which came out, I think, the week after the last Connect, um, there, uh, basically, uh, the key reset upstreaming work that Matthew did got uh, completed. Um, we also had the uh, power supply wake-up source enablements that Zoran did uh, was merged, and uh, some binder type cleanups for 64-bit that Servan did uh, were merged. Um, there is uh, uh, MMC power management improvements um, that uh, both uh, Ulf and Zoran had worked on uh, that were merged for 3.13, and the RTC uh, wake-up source uh, uh, that Zoran got in for 3.13 as well landed. Um, and then for 3.14, uh, the ion cleanup uh, and uh, was merged into staging, so that's uh, exciting. Um, and then also at AOSP, um, Serban managed to get some binder 64-bit ABI, ABI rework done with Arve, um, and so that's uh, nice. And that's, some of that's already queued for 3.15. Um, external from sort of uh, uh, work that we've been kind of working on um, just in the community, there's been things like the FunctionFS support for uh, ConfigFS uh, gadget. Um, this basically uh, is the hopeful successor to the Android gadget driver. Um, and that's been done by folks at Samsung that got merged. Uh, and then there's ongoing work with the DMA buff sync uh, work that uh, Martin Langhorst at uh, Canonical has been doing. Um, and that will uh, integrate with uh, the Android sync points um, and hopefully 3.15 or 3.16. It looks like it's getting good feedback, so uh, it hopefully will be soon. Um, and I'm sure there's even more that I haven't been able to keep track of. Um, Another thing, uh, this isn't exactly connected with Android upstreaming, but it's something that we spend time on, and so just kind of wanted to put it up there. We keep track of the, the Linaro Android branch. Uh, basically, it's the merging the AOSP tree forward ported against Linux's uh, head, um, and it includes a few small fixes. Um, and we've done it for basically each kernel release for each of the monthly Linux Linaro releases, as well as uh, the uh, LSK tree. Um, as far as the current delta, hopefully that's visible, I don't know, um, might be a little bit of an eye chart. Um, this is kind of the, I basically did a diff stat against uh, 314, against the uh, Lenaro Android 314 merge, um, and sorted kind of by the largest deltas, uh, and so I color coded if it's any help here. Um, in the red items there, that's the uh, net filter uh, changes, which uh, Matthew's hopefully working to reduce. Um, we've got in the green, that's uh, the Android gadget driver, which uh, the ConfigFS gadget hopefully will be reducing soon. Um, then we've got in the blue, there's the uh, ADB gadget, uh, or not ADB, sorry, um, the uh, Android display framework, which uh, is uh, some new uh, work that Android's uh, uh, put in recently in 3.10. Um, and so uh, there's also the FIQ debugger is another one that's up there fairly high um, that Daniel's uh, just started working on. Um, and then we've got the uh, CPU frequency interactive is the next one in that top chunk, uh, which uh, we don't have uh, anyone on our team directly focused on that, but uh, it's basically uh, a lot of the power work that's being done in the scheduler um, in Lenaro is uh, connected to that, so uh, that hopefully will be uh, going away whenever that gets resolved. Um, there's uh, 
the second one that's in white there is the binder um, changes uh, that should be queued for 3.15. And then finally, the ETM, which uh, Matthew has started doing some research on. Um, as far as kind of the total net delta we've got is about 30,000 lines of uh, insertions, at least, uh, uh, that uh, is in the current delta. Um, and uh, to compare that with 3.10, where we had 35,000. And uh, then if you look even further back to the 3.4 tree, right, it's 150,000 almost. So um, we've been getting good improvement. Uh, the curve's coming down. Um, and so I'm very optimistic about it. There is an aspect of the items that are listed here. Um, it's sort of, uh, those are, these contribute to, I think, something like 16,000 lines of change. So it's about uh, half of the total. Um, but there is a very, very long tail. And so it, there's a lot of files that have little teeny changes in them um, all over. So those are still things that we're going to have to address. Um, so given that set of uh, uh, outstanding big items, these are kind of the next areas of focus that we're hoping to look at, um, the ETM and ETB, which Matthew's been starting uh, research on. Um, the Android gadget to configFS gadget uh, uh, driver change, that's something where a good chunk of the upstream, or a good chunk of the functionality is already upstream. Um, and so really, it may just need a little bit of user space uh, work in order to make that happen. But I'm not confident that that would be uh, enough. So there may be uh, some need to look into the specific functions that the Android gadget uh, provides to make sure that there's uh, similar user space equivalents. Um, the FIQ debugger, again, Daniel's going to be uh, digging into here. And uh, then ADF, which we don't have any current plans for, but uh, we've been working with the graphics team to try to figure out how we can start chipping away at it. And there's continuing work, uh, stuff that we've been doing uh, sometimes for quite a while. Um, we've got the net filter work with Matt, you just described, um, the uh, ION DMA buff helpers, which uh, I've been working with Sumit. Uh, to try to get sorted. Um, there's the volatile ranges work, which is sort of the infinite project. Um, it's uh, been going on now for quite a while, but uh, it's gotten some good review recently, so I'm hoping that maybe we'll get uh, some more maintainer interest in that. Um, we're also looking at influencing the KD bus development. Um, so I don't know if folks have been following along with some of the community uh, discussions, but uh, Greg Corartman was initially hoping that KD bus would be able to replace Binder, but, uh, you know, as KDBus is kind of firmed up as to what it's uh, likely to be uh, pushed upstream, um, he's kind of feeling that that's unlikely to be the case, at least anytime soon. Um, so basically, we're going to take here to uh, um, try to understand Binder and uh, KDBus well so that we're able to um, try to influence the development as much as possible in order to uh, find places where we can share code. Um, and maybe infrastructure. Um, you know, one easy uh, chunk of code that will be similar is, is so the ashmem and memfd uh, functionalities are very similar. So um, there, hopefully there'll be some overlap there that we'll be able to share. Um, Going to continue helping with other internal projects that uh, are related to Android, um, and then uh, try to find ways to uh, help the uh, Android developers move their user space over to uh, make use of upstream, already upstream solutions. So we have things like the uh, memory pressure notifiers um, that were done quite a while ago. But uh, basically, um, this is functionality that can replace the low memory uh, killer daemon. Um, and uh, it, it's just something that we're working on uh, uh, trying to help the Android guys make that transition, um, similar with the key reset. Um, Wanted to say thank you. Um, this is kind of the team of folks who have been working uh, uh, with us. Um, it, to some extent, some of these are volunteers who have really other projects. Uh, a lot of, I think everybody basically has other priorities other than this. So they've kind of been doing this in their spare time um, as, as, or helping as they can. So I really wanted to say thank you. Um, you know, it, it's one of those things where it's really been a, a great group. Um, so appreciate it. <laughs> um, and then I just wanted to bring up some stuff for open discussion. Um, basically, uh, if you have any, well, Matthew just ran out of the room. So if you have any not filter related questions, you can, now it's probably a good time. Um, also, uh, uh, if you have any specific uh, kernel related pain points in your Android device development, I'd like to hear about it. Stuff where you know, it's, it's, you're running into trouble uh, uh, bringing up devices, um, because that's something that we can try to see how we can make easier. Um, and then uh, I'm. Curious if anyone's actually looking at using ADF for their future devices and having any experience in that, or if that's something that's just on the radar for most folks. Um, 
And then if anybody has adjustments or suggestions for changes in focus, uh, and also if there's any extra resources, there's uh, tons of work to do. So uh, it would be great to see if, I guess, it's call for more volunteers, basically. <laughs> uh, so any, any comments? We can pass mics around, or people can come up and just talk in a circle or something. I don't know. Questions for Matthew? I mean, now's a good time. <laughs> Dun, dun, dun. So what's the what's the extent of the adoption of the new suspend or wake up source and suspend opportunistic suspend stuff in mainline? Are there still trickles of suspend block or wake locks kind of in kernel drivers uh, sprinkled around? In um, so basically everything that was in the common tree, I believe, is pushed up. But Zoran was working on that with the um, RTC and some of the. Um, uh, yeah, well, there's MMC and there's something else too that I'm forgetting now, but. Yeah, there's just a handful of them that he'd gone through. Um, now, for the individual device trees, there may be more. But um, at least for the common baseline stuff that's already upstream, um, the delta should be basically at zero now. We didn't look into individual device suspend or zoom hooks. Uh, it's just a uh, common framework. So the user mode is actually using the in-kernel opportunistic suspend mm -hmm. infrastructure. Yeah, and they've actually been doing that. Uh, they backported that to 3.4. And so uh, as of Jellybean, I believe they uh, were using that. Oh, good. OK, I, I guess I misunderstood that. I thought they were still kind of dragging feet on adopting No. They, well, I mean, so it was, it was one of those. They got rid of the uh, early suspend and all of that stuff as well and moved over to the new model. So oh, great. Um, Serpent, come on up. You should be up here. <laughs> He's one of our, uh, I don't know, non-assignee adopted members. I was wondering, uh, I saw that you plan to move Ashman uh, out of staging. Uh, but I was wondering if anybody knows uh, what would be the future of Ashman. It used to be used in Dalvik for ma mapping uh, Dalvik heaps yeah. uh, so that we can keep a track of the where the GT code lives and we can shrink that as we go. Uh, however, in art, uh, we moved away from that, and we use uh, normal mmap, yeah. and hopefully soon map with huge TLP. So the Android guys uh, made a change, which basically introduced what they call named VMAs. And so basically, they have an interface that they're able to say, you know, this chunk of memory has this name, and then it shows up in the debug information when you're looking at, uh, uh, yeah. you know, uh, proc, your uh, proc PID, whatever. Um, and so uh, uh, that will basically Ashman has three chunks of functionality. One is the um, you know memory unpinning, which is what the volatile ranges tries to address. Um, the next one is the uh, uh, the, the basically the naming, naming. of uh, chunks. Yeah. Um, and then the last is basically the ability to atomically create uh, tempfs or unlinked tempfs f file descriptors. Yeah. Um, and so that last piece is one that is very similar to what the memfd work that is being done with the KD bus. So we're trying to find a way that we can share um, you know, a, a tool to be able to generate those uh, atomically unlinked tempfs files. Um, yeah, and so the, the, the VMA naming one, that's when Colin sent to the list, and it got some kind of middling interest. Um, but you know, some key guys actually, you know, Ingo liked it and thought it should go in. So it's one of those things where it's, it's not. Um, uh, okay, something that everybody's against. Um, so it, it, it's one of those things where I just I feel like it maybe needs another push to get in. But uh, I think Colin kind of sent it out there and kind of has uh, been busy doing other stuff. So. OK, thanks. Nope, no worries. Okay, anything else? A toolchain question. Uh, what toolchains, GC or something else you use for Android development? What's their status, and whether you are happy with the status of the toolchains for Android? So I don't have as much context there. I know it's a little bit. It's not 4.8. I think it's 4.7 that they're using. But um, maybe you could clarify. Or sorry, yeah. 
either or. Okay, so uh, for our internal releases, we use 4.8.3. Uh, we have experimental 4.9 out, so we might be setting up a demo build uh, with that toolchain. So 4.9 is something which is we have recently uh, moved to, so we don't have status for that. But uh, 4.8.3 is performing good for us. Yeah, but the default is what? Which one? Uh, v. Uh, okay, now uh, we are using 4.8.3. I think GC, uh, AOS, stock AOSP is on 4.7. Yeah. So, so for the AOSP3, uh, we use a Google build toolchain because we use a different linker. Therefore, we need a different uh, toolchain that would write the correct uh, linker in the in the L file. Uh, so Google uses 4.8, and uh, I guess the, the plan would be to move forward. But they they were usually reluctant on moving uh, on the first release. Any other questions? That may be it. All right, going. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for coming out. And uh, yeah, again, feel free to send email if you have any other further questions that uh, come up after the fact. But uh, thanks so much.